views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Coming straight up on this edition of Perspectives, President Barack Obama is the subject of our conversation. How is the president faring given the fact of many international crises as well as domestic things on the home front? That's front and center <laughs> on this edition of Perspectives with yours truly, Darren Hyman. Relevant to life, you bring it to the table. Whether you make a move solo or a movement with a stable. No fables, you speak on your decisions. Cause in the long run, it's your voice, your views, your vision. Keeping it real with many messages for you to know. This ain't radio, but DJ runs the show. Entertainment, he rocks it. Politics, he locks it. The host with the most would handle any topic. Don't forget to share your perspective, which shines a light. Cause it might make a difference in someone else's life. And hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Perspectives. I am Darren Jaime. Of course, we invite you to stay connected to Perspectives. You can check us out at Bronx Dead Perspectives on Facebook, and then hit us up on Twitter. There you'll be able to talk about some past episodes of this show, talk about some future episodes, get your chance to share your perspective, because that's exactly uh, what we want to hear. Coming up front and center on this edition of the show, we're talking about President Barack Obama and the recent controversy surrounding the House uh, suing the president or the potential of possibly suing the president. What exactly does this mean for the president, his <laughs> legacy, and then also how serious and how effective can a lawsuit be against the president of the United States? Joining us now to go front and center on this issue is our political analyst and professor at SUNY Maritime, Mark Myritz, who joins us, and uh, good well, to have you here. It's great to be here. Good. To t uh, so let's go right into it. Uh, mm. First of all, the <laughs> GOP making the suggestion that they want to sue the president of the United States uh, for a multiplicity of things. Never really heard of a president really being sued. Talk about it. Well, I don't, I mean, I know the Constitution. I've read it. I don't see anything in there about the uh, House suing the president. The only thing that's in there uh, there are some checks and balances between the different branches, and we have separation of powers between the executive, legislative, and judicial branches. Now, there is a provision there for impeachment and conviction of a president, impeachment of the president for high crimes and misdemeanors. There's nothing in there about bringing lawsuits. Um, if a president is accused of high crimes and misdemeanors, but frankly, Darren, we don't even know what it means because it's only happened uh, in our history two times where we've had President Clinton was impeached but not convicted and President Andrew Johnson was impeached and not convicted. We've never had a president convicted and certainly President Obama, I think by any stretch of the imagination has not committed any high crimes and misdemeanors. Maybe he's done some things to annoy the, uh, the Republicans in the House, but I mean, uh, you know, impeachment, ridiculous, and suing and spending money to sue is a waste of money. A waste of taxpayer <clears throat> dollars. Exactly. And, and, and secondly, someone says <clears throat> in one breath, this is the president under whose administration you bring down Osama bin Laden, and in the next breath, you're talking about actually suing him. To the outsider looking in, and to many Americans looking in, <clears throat> first of all, you talked about the ridiculous waste of taxpayer dollars. Right. But second of all, it brings to light the question of, what do you really want? Well, what the suit is about is the allegation or the claim by the uh, Congress or the Republicans. It's not the Democrats that are suing. Um, and actually, when this came up in the uh, debate in the committees and in the floor, uh, you know, of course, the Democrats are not approving of this, and the Republicans, this is the Republicans' uh, uh, mojo, this is their plan. But their, their argument is that the president has exceeded his authority as the head of the executive branch. Their point is, their argument, whether, whether it's uh, wrong or right, is that when they pass a bill and, they, uh, and the president signs it, the president's supposed to implement or carry out the legislation. Uh, what has happened is that the president, on a number of uh, 
pieces of legislation. Bills that have been passed has made some modification or tweaks in those legislations. So for example, I think on Obamacare, he punted or postponed some, ex some uh, dates that were deadlines in connection with Obamacare and when these things were supposed to come into effect. He's made some executive decisions. He's even said, I think, that if the Congress doesn't do it, I'll do it. I'm the president. So it's really a clash of power between the executive branch and the legislative branch. Can the president take a piece of legislation that he signed that the Congress has approved, right, in our normal procedure, and start modifying it and tweaking it? The Republicans in Congress say the president has, out, has gone way beyond his authority. The president says, I'm just doing my job. So to me, it's a clash between the branches and it's not a lawsuit. And how would you resolve such a lawsuit? I don't even know whether it's worth the money that they're spending for it, because if it goes to the courts uh, and, and whether the courts have, would have to say first that they have jurisdiction to hear the case, which is debatable, they might not throw it out directly and say, this is not, this is a political issue. This is not an issue that a court's supposed to adjudicate. But even if they did, at the end of the day, the president's doing his job, the Congress is doing their job, um, how do you check the president? Checks and balances, separation of powers. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. And so when mm -hmm. you have the president under this lawsuit yes. or the potential of a possible lawsuit, right. I've asked the question before, uh, <clears throat> the backfire. Because to right. take a president to task, even on some Republicans, they're saying this is, this is a little bit ludicrous. <clears throat> you talk about suing the president of the United right. States. And you have some who are literally worried about losing their seats by being partakers of this lawsuit. Can this have a negative impact on the Republican Party given the fact midterm elections right around the corner? Well, it's really a two-edged sword, okay? So it could backfire, but on the other hand, the Republicans in Congress are trying to make a point with the lawsuit. They're using the taxpayer dollars, as you said, Darren, to make the point. The point they're trying to make is that, that Republicans say, we think the president has gone too far and he doesn't have the power to do the things he's doing. Now, to begin with, they don't like Obama health care, right? They've passed bill after bill after bill after bill to terminate Obama health care, but it doesn't go anywhere because the democratically controlled Senate won't approve it. Mm. So they're trying to make a point, but at the same time, by bringing this lawsuit. So is it a real lawsuit that they really want to bring it to fruition? So we, we really don't know, and honestly, I don't think it has any legs or any efficacy, but the fact is they're making their point, and that's the whole game. The game plan is to make the point before the midterm elections, lawsuit or no lawsuit, whether the lawsuit is valid or not. I mean, I heard that there was an interesting debate that I was listening to on C-SPAN among constitutional scholars about this whole thing, and it's very debatable whether it has any validity in law, but the Republicans don't care. They want to make their point. They want to hit the president on Obama health care, on, on his power to tweak and modify Obama health care. That's the point they want to make. Will it backfire? It could, but uh, it, it's debatable. I think that uh, most of the people in the country, honestly, Darren, I don't think they understand the whole lawsuit. Yeah, they don't even lot, get it. Lot, they don't get it. No, a lot of people, a lot of people are simply <clears throat> lost by it. But when you talk about the Republican Party, look <clears throat> at the fact of Eric Cantor losing his seat. That's right. Obviously, a Republican should have a lot to be concerned about going into these GOP elections uh, with Eric Cantor losing his seat. Mm -hmm. People are saying, listen, you know, a new message is being sent. Agree, disagree. No, I think Eric Cantor's story is different. Uh, that's really the internal debate and fight between the Tea Party people, the extremists, and the so-called moderates of the Republican Party. Um, you know, Eric Cantor just wasn't extreme enough. The Tea Party took him out. So, I mean, the Tea Party loves this lawsuit. So, I mean, I don't think they're, they're the, I mean, the Eric Cantor thing is really that Republicans have to worry that if they don't support these extreme things like this lawsuit, they're going to get knocked out of office. That's the problem. As far as backfiring, the truth of the matter is, I don't think that the average American understands what in the heck they're doing in Congress. They've already shut down. They're not even paying attention. Because all they do is bicker. It's, uh, for example, the other day, a Republican got up to make some sort of a criticism of the Democrats and the leadership of uh, President Obama. And Nancy Pelosi ran across the congressional, uh, was screaming at the guy and even the Democratic uh, Congress 
Congress people were looking and saying, like, what, what, what in the world is she doing? But the whole tenor of there's a conversation that has fallen apart. There is no bipartisanship in the, in the, on the Hill, and that's really, really bad. So from the point of view of the American people, they're not doing anything worthwhile anyway. So if they're suing each other, you know, just par for the course. So no, but no <coughs> bipartisanship at all. What is it going to take to see some bipartisan effort? What are the bipartisan bills that are actually going to be able to flow through the House and the Senate, given the fact that if America is really going to run <clears throat> and America is going to be productive, it has to take a bipartisan effort. Well, there was an opportunity for a bipartisan effort on immigration, and that fell apart, okay? Uh, there have been a lot of lost opportunities. Now, I think, really, the blame is on both sides. It's not just on the Republicans. It's also on the Democrats, uh, you know, depending on where, you know, how you look at things, your prism. But I think that um, at the end of the day, uh, I think it's hopeless, really, uh, depending. And, and, and I also say the results of the, the, of the midterm elections will be key to understand what this is, what's going to happen. Now, if the House remains Republican, the Senate goes Republican, and President Obama, of course, is the president, I'm, uh, I mean, that is just going to be an, uh, it could be an ugly scenario because there's a lot of antipathy between the, the House and the president, the House and the Democratic Party. If the Democrats retain the Senate, you're just going to have, I think, more of the same. Mm -hmm. You have a lame duck president, um, a president who wants a legacy, but the, but the House is bitter. They're suing him, for God's sakes. They're not going to give him a legacy, even if the American people are the losers in the process. Democratic Senate, do we <clears throat> foresee the Democrats being able to hold on to the Senate? I mean, there are a few seats that are in question. And I think that um, there's a chance that they might be able to take it. I mean, uh, it's possible. But, um, you know, we could just end up having the same. I mean, it, uh, but either way, either way, the Democrats retain power or the Republicans take the Senate, you will have complete gridlock on, ca on, on Capitol Hill and in the, in the government. So it won't make any difference. And I think also uh, maybe President Obama has to take a little responsibility for this and maybe try to do something different. When he gets up at a press conference and says, oh, they're suing me, I'm just doing my job. Okay, sounds good, good sound bite, but he's the president. You know, we look to him for leadership. He, I think he needs another angle. I, I would be great for him to be able to go out of office with some of these legacies. I mean, Obama healthcare, I'm not too optimistic about. But some of the other things that he brought up, gun control, immigration, some of the other things I think could happen if he had a different approach. The approach is I'm doing my job and they're doing their job and they're trying to destroy me. That, that just doesn't, it doesn't, cut, uh, it doesn't cut muster in my opinion. I don't think it works. Coming up after the break, we're going to talk <laughs> a little bit more with Mark and as we discuss front and center the Obama schedule, exactly where the president has been traveling, uh, a lot of controversy surrounding the president's schedule and his ability and or inability to lead. Mark has a perspective on that. We'll bring that in uh, right after the break. Stay with us. This was me. And mom and dad. And my big brother Alex. And Jack. And this was the day that I learned that sandals get their name from sand. That jellyfish aren't made of jelly. That stars don't just come from the sky. That the ocean is bigger than all of us. This is the day we all got to forget that I was sick. And it changed everything. This was my wish. NFC, AFC, offensive linemen, defensive tackles, quarterbacks, and cornerbacks are all living united to ensure the academic success of millions of kids in our communities all the way to graduation day. But that won't happen without you. So take the pledge at unitedway.org. Make a difference in the life of a child. Suit up like your favorite NFL players and become a volunteer reader, tutor, or mentor with United Way. Wow, these are really good. You act surprised.
Practice makes perfect. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who don't need perfection. They need you. What's on your mind? Let him know. What's on your mind? What's on your mind? Hey, we're back here on Perspectives. Darren Jaime here with you, our guest in studio, political analyst, SUNY Maritime Professor Mark Myritz, talking politics, talking to President Barack Obama. And uh, before the break, we were talking a little bit about uh, your thoughts on the president. A and you have a particular perspective <laughs> because you feel as though the president in this day is being stretched too thin. I think so. I mean, there was some, as you alluded to, some criticism about this fundraising trip that the president took, I think, three days to California. Got a lot of uh, pushback on that. Um, nothing wrong with the president to go fundraising. Uh, that's part of his job. He's the president, head of his party. But the world is literally falling apart. I mean, literally, the Ukrainians are shooting planes out of the sky. ISIS is taking over Iraq and Syria, and now they're in Lebanon, and they're even pushing the Kurds back in Kurdistan. This is an unmitigated disaster. Gaza is a flame. There's a war going on, a full war with rockets. Um, but uh, the but president... But one says, but one says though, in, <clears throat> in, in deference to the president, yes. where you got an Air Force One that has everything on there. That's true. You've got all, you've got all the necessary things to be able to latch into. That's true. So, I mean, why not travel? Okay, it, it, fair enough. And as I said, that's the president has that option. But it's also a matter of visuals. It's a visual. How does it look? How does it sound? What's the perception? The president is flying off. Yes, he's got the plane, but he's not in Washington 24-7 in the Situation Room. And especially because of these other crises. Um, and, and my other point is that I think the president and the secretary of state, are, they're stretched too thin, as you said before. Why? Because there's, there are these issues that are literally uh, causing the, uh, the and I'm mean, saying again, the world, to, me, to me, the world seems to be falling apart. It's not really psychological. It's realistic. Mm -hmm. You have ISIS fighters going into cities in Iraq and beheading and crucifying people. I mean, this is ridiculous. How does the civilized world allow this? Boko Haram is kidnapping hundreds of young girls and forcing them into slavery. I mean, in the modern world today. I mean, I'm not saying the United States is responsible for everything, but on the president's schedule and the secretary of state's schedule, they don't need to be meeting with countries. They should put off these appointments. I'm sorry, business as usual has got to stop, and they've got to start for, I'm not saying they're not doing their job, but the perception is that they're going to business summits, and, you know, it's very, very nice, and it's very important to provide, as the president says, you know, iPhone technology to Africa. I think it's great. I don't right. want to criticize it. But when the world is literally aflame, you've got to have your prioritization of what is important and what is not. I'm not saying it's not important. Sure, it's important. We should be helping economically, you know, the African countries. It's very important. Or Asia, or Latin America, or any of these countries. But not, we're in the middle of a crisis. Again, I don't want to beat it to death, but they shot a plane out of the sky. Right. They, take, they took over Crimea, now, and what was the repercussion? But the Nothing. question, but the, I'll Nothing. tell you what Washington Insider please, said to me, please, and I'll, please, share, please, and I'll please, share with you. Please. What Washington Insider says, Darren, it's kind of like me talking to you. I said, what is it? He says, he says you, you, I can't get you on the phone. He said, so everybody expects the president to be here sitting behind a desk waiting for so, waiting to take care of business. But the truth be told, if I decide to call across seas, they're not necessarily taking my call right now. That's true. They're ignoring. They're doing. So what are we supposed to do? Sit by on the phone and wait? Or fair, do I or do fair I Fair enough. Fair enough. Again, this is not meant as a criticism. It's an observation. When the president went to West Point to speak to the cadets and telling them the United States is not going to be sending you into battle and basically the United States is retrenching and we're not going to be involved, that sends a message not only to the enemies of the United States out there, of which there are many, but also to our friends and our allies out there. Do we have their back or don't we have their back? And the fact of the matter is that many of our allies in the world, for example, Saudi Arabia, right? Mm. They feel they, that we don't have their back. They feel they're under threat from Iran. Iran is going nuclear, and they're still having conversations. But I you mean, also have Americans, though, who <clears> say, listen, <throat> I'm tired of war. I'm tired of Afghanistan. Right. I'm tired of Iraq. I'm tired of seeing our young people come back That's home right. in body bags. So let's stop. So can somebody give me the blessed assurance of letting me know that we're not going to see this? I absolutely 100,000% agree with what you're saying. You know, there's a book by Richard Haas, and it says, American foreign policy begins at home. And he basically goes to this point, which he says, we have plenty of problems here, okay, in America. 
and we're just spending too much time focusing on all these things. And, and happily, President Obama took us out of Iraq and took us out of Afghanistan. As you said, exactly. Here's the problem. It's a big problem. There is no other go-to power in the world. There isn't any. I mean, if there's a problem in Kurdistan, right? If the, if the Iraqi ISIS is going to take over the Kurds, the Peshmerga, and defeating them, which is a, is a disastrous calamity for the world, it's a do, I don't know if it's a domino theory, but it looks like they're building this caliphate. And it's scary and killing people and murdering people in the process. Who's the go-to uh, country in the world that's going to go in and help? Who's the go-to country if there's, a, uh, if there's a disastrous earthquake or if there's some calamity in the world? Who is number one front and center that sends help? The right. United States, and that's our thing. We can't just step back from that. I, you know, as much as the president wants to do it, and as much as, by the way, you're 100% right, that's the sentiment out there in America. Yeah, I think there's that's a difference the between. Sentiment. I think there's a difference between sending help <clears throat> and sending people to war. Exactly. I think there's a, there's, a, there's a huge difference. So to put troops out there to help something, You're that's right. one thing. To send them to war is something else. You're right. And and, and then on top of that, let's put it in context: hmm. the fact that this war, you send them out there for a war, there didn't have to be a war. That's the reality. Okay, uh, two points. First of all, and that's not head to his watch. Either. No, no, I I totally agree with you once again. However. I don't think the proposal would be to send troops to war. The question is, if the rebels in Syria are fighting Assad, how about helping them out? Didn't do that. How about helping out some of our allies around the world when, they're in, when they have problems? For example, the uh, Ukrainians who came to the United States and said, we need help against these Russians. And a lot of these friends of ours out there, we're leaving them high and dry. We're not paying attention to them. I am not proposing to send troops. There's no sentiment in our country to send troops and start another Iraq and another Afghanistan. No way. But we have to be able to support our friends with materiel, with, with ammunition, with weaponry. We have to help them, and we're not helping them. Uh, in Iraq, we have a very, very bad policy uh, supporting this uh, Iraqi government, which is dysfunctional, and leaving a lot of our friends like the Kurds hanging in the balance. We've got to help them, not send troops. I agree with you. Okay. Not well, send troops. As far as not being there in the first place, I don't disagree with you on that either. But the, the trouble is, we were there. We did what America did what it did. Um, uh, President Obama pulled this out, and you know what? There are consequences, and there's, fu there's fallout but, from but it. How much of the president's legacy <clears throat> is going to be defined by foreign policy? Because to me, I think most presidents are going to be defined by what goes on around here. If the poor are still poor, if the unemployed are still right, unemployed, right, if the kids right. don't have money to go to school, right. if housing market is still shrinking, right. if you know the bailout doesn't work, I think those are the things that the President of the United <clears> States <throat> ultimately is going to be graded on for his legacy. Right. I agree with you. I, again, agree with you. However, I think that uh, while foreign policy is not something that uh, really grabs people's attention, it's true. And what grabs people, people's attention is unemployment, the economy, health care. Yeah, that's what grabs people. But the, but, the, but the point is, when the President is making a political analysis, a political calculation, because he's looking at the midterm elections, he's looking at 2016, and he's trying to make the right political calculation. And the other thing is, there's nobody more astute than President Obama than reading the pulse of the American people. He reads it perfect. He mm -hmm. understands the people. He understands what the people are feeling. But sometimes if you're the president, you do have to, to have that legacy, you do have to do some out-of-the-box stuff, some stuff that you might think is not in your political calculation, and I'm thinking he's going to do it. I have the hope because I see his ability to do so. Stay tuned. We'll find out more. Mark Myers joins us when we return. Coming up, we take our uh, a look, I should say, a forecast <clears throat> into the upcoming presidential election. Hard to think that the president's almost out of office, but the fact of the matter is, he is. And what's go who, I should say, and what's going to be the major topic of conversation. That's coming up next, right after this.
Ryan. Back here on Perspectives, closing out the show with some uh, final talk about the President of the United right. States. Not President Barack Obama, but the next President of the United States. A lot of names still circulating out there. Rand Paul, Hillary Clinton, Chris Christie. Romney. Mitt Romney. Take it away. Gee, I wouldn't prognosticate about politics. You know, there was a, a diplomat from uh, Morocco, ambassador, who once said, and he said, if you prognosticate about politics, you make astrology a hard science. <laughs> so I don't think astrology is a hard science. So let's not prognosticate. But Hillary Clinton is the name, the name. That's the big name. And the question is, is Hillary going to run? And, uh, and I really think she is going to run. This is her, you know, this is her modus, her, 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 life, uh, her life project is to become president and to make history to be the wife, you know, the presidential, the wife is a president, husband president, the Clinton legacy, tremendous. Um, she's certainly qualified to be president. The question is, um, can, she, um, can she make that jump? As far as Chris Christie is concerned, I think he's very tarnished by the bridge gate. Uh, he's trying to undo it. I don't know if he can undo it, and that's his going. That that's his legacy, unfortunately. I mean, as far as Christie is concerned, you know, maybe he didn't know about the bridge, but um, he has people really? around him. Well, uh, I mean, no, uh, wait a minute. Look, uh, you know, I mean, I'm going to be an, I'm going to be um, I'm not going to be a realist. I'll just mm -hmm. be uh, you know an, an optimist and say the glass of water is half full. So maybe he didn't know. It's but even if he empty. even if he didn't know. He surrounded himself with people that were just, you know, inappropriate. Sort of like the Nixon thing, you know. Mm. You know, did Nixon know? Yeah, well, he, yeah, he did, and the cover up and all that. But look at the bunch of people he had around Mark, him. You don't shut down the George Washington Bridge and not know about it. You just don't. There's no way you can tell me that a governor does not know how to shut mm. you shut down something as major as the George Washington Bridge and you know nothing of it. Next, keep going. Okay, so Chris Christie is uh, <laughs> toast. Thank you, Darren. Okay, next point. Uh, Romney having a comeback. Okay, I, I think that's, that could be realistic. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be. Um, you know, he, he missed the boat. Uh, he's a smart guy. Uh, you know, he's, Better luck the second time. Yeah, yeah, may, you never know. I mean, if, that, if they have got nobody better, they probably put him in. I mean, the thing is that, the thing is that Hillary is... You know, she is uh, running on all engines, and she's got a lot of popularity. Her book wasn't very popular, but nobody really wants to sit down and read a book of 500 pages about foreign policy, which we just talked about. Right. And then she flew around the world and had a lot of travel. That's fine. Uh, maybe they'll bring up the Republicans, bring up some stuff about the Clinton legacy. Benghazi. Uh, yeah, Benghazi. You know, Benghazi is a big thing. There's no question. And that is the grist for the mill for the Republicans. If she to bring can get Benghazi. around Benghazi, the yeah. belief is that she probably will run. She's home if she free. Can't, That's then. right. We'll, we'll see. All right. I mean, exactly. That's There's, why we bring you back. You yeah, exactly. Back yeah, no, we have to see what happens. That's it. Exactly. All righty. Mark Myers, our guest in studio. Thank you, Mark, for coming it's, to share with us. It's my pleasure, Darren. All righty. Stay tuned to Perspectives as we continue <clears> to bring you more on the political landscape. As always, you can catch Mark here on Perspectives, as well as you can catch him on Open, giving political commentary, letting us know exactly what's happening in the world of politics. Well, that about wraps up for this edition. We thank you for watching. Until the next time we meet, stay safe and share your perspective with somebody else. It just might make a difference in their life. Take care. Relevant to life, you bring it to the table. Whether you make a move solo or a movement with a stable. No fables, just speak on your decisions. Cause in the long run, it's your voice, your views, your vision. Keeping it real with many messages for you to know. This ain't radio, but DJ runs the show. Entertainment, he rocks it. Politics, he locks it. The host with the most would handle any topic. Don't forget to share your perspective, which shines a light. Cause